praise the living God, the sons and daughters of God. This far we've come, the Lord is indeed our Ebenezer. First time viewers, I want to welcome you to Baruch Savant. We are soul winning through aggressive, effective evangelism is our main agenda. Especially as we see that the coming of our Lord is so soon. He said that, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give unto everyone according to what he or she has done. Just trying to paraphrase it. Today we are privileged again to have a man servant of God, Pastor George Agunga, who will break unto us the bread of life from the heavenly bakery. But before then, uh, I wish to remind us that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jewish first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is by faith that you are going to live, even in the uh, perilous times that are going to come, just be ahead of us. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to store up the spiritual bank and depend on Jesus Christ, that he may lead us to the very end. Eternity is very narrow. It only awaits us to accept the gospel, that we may be transformed and revived. As I welcome the man of God, I admonish us to share from a word of prayer that we may be blessed. Father in heaven, thank you so much for inviting us today. You've called us to fix us from wherever we are, be it morning, be it afternoon, be it evening, that you may speak to us the word through your man servant, Lord. May he not be seen, but you be seen. Hide him behind the cross and speak through him. For this we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank God for his word and the blessings and the privilege to share his word and his love and his goodness to us. He's a faithful God. And as we've been talking about, or we desire to talk about the gospel, we need to understand what the gospel is. And before Christ comes, we need to understand what must take place before he comes. Amen. We desire the second coming of Christ, but until this happens, shall we see him in power and great glory. So I'm going to share something with you briefly concerning the gospel. Okay, let me say that differently. I want to share with you in the next 15 minutes the gospel. Okay. And I've given it a, a title which is going to be very brief. The title is, Which is the Greatest Sin? Or what is the greatest sin? Let me pray again. Dear Father, Father in heaven, our God and our Savior, we thank you for your blessings. Lead us into your word. Forgive us our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Which is the greatest sin? And I, I want to impress in your mind the concept of sin. But I give, I've given that title or that subject, which is the greatest sin, so that we can avoid it. If we can know which is the greatest sin, that sin which is so hyonious that if we participate in it continually, until it lays hold of us, then we don't see the face of God. So we want to look at which is the greatest sin. And before we come to the end of this brief study, something else, something else you need to understand is, then who is the greatest sinner? Because if we identify the greatest sin, then we'll know those committing the greatest sin must be the greatest offenders. We'll first begin by the biblical definition of sin. And once again, I don't want your mind to dwell so much on sin, but unless I tell you this, will you understand what salvation is? So let's look at the biblical definition of sin. And for this study, I'm not going to dwell ab about the nature of sin. For now, not the nature of sin. Now, what we're going to look at simply is the biblical definition of sin. We're not dealing with the nature now, because if you talk of the nature of sin, then we we'll conclude Christ must be the greatest sinner. Because he bore all the sins of the humanity upon himself. He took it in himself. So for now, I'm not dealing with the concept of how is a man a sinner? What is the nature of sin itself? But you're going to look at this concept of sin by simply defining the personality or me as a person. Now, living alone, my birth or being born a sinner because all humanity... But the default of our first birth in Adam, in Adam, or through Adam, 
we come into this world full of sin. But let's look at now this concept of what is sin according to the Bible. Let's go to 1 John 3 verse 4. Whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So according to that, that passage, sin is the transgression of the law. Call it disobedience or lawlessness. So sin is the transgression, the breaking of the law. Now having that concept in mind, and keep in mind, all of us are sinners. So by the concept of our nature or how we come into the world, we come already in a fallen nature, full of sin. So I'm not talking of that nature of sin before now, but I'm dealing with a sinner choosing to continue now in the acts of sin. And now we, did, we define that carefully. Then who will be the greatest sinner? Or who has sinned more? Once again, keep in mind, I'm not talking about the nature of sin because all have come short of the glory of God. Why? All have sinned. But now look at that text once again. Sin is the transgression of the law. It is disobedience. It is breaking the law. It is lawlessness. Having that in mind now, if sin is the transgression of the law or breaking of the law of God, and our subject is, which is the greatest sin? What is the greatest sin? Then, if sin is breaking the law of God, then we need to identify which is the greatest law. For if I break the greatest law, then I've, I've done the greatest sin. As a result, I become the greatest offender. Let me say that again. We've so defined sin according to the scripture that it is the transgression or breaking of the law of God. Now we're going to look at the law of God. Or let's say we're going to look at the Ten Commandments of God within a short time and know which is the greatest commandment of all. So that if we know the greatest commandment and breaking that great commandment, uh, lead to a greater sinner, then we identify what that great sin is. Let's turn to Mark now, chapter 12. What is the greatest sin? And we're studying this so that we can avoid it. And not by our own works, by the way. Christ says, without me can do nothing. So keep that in mind. So we're going to look at this concept of the greatest sin then through God's grace, we're going to ask ourselves, are we committing this sin? If the answer is positive, yes, then we're going to ask God the solution to that greatest sin. And God is faithful. If we ask according to Matthew 7, 7, he will give us that victory. So let's turn to chapter 12 of Mark. Let's read verse 28. Then came unto him one of the scribes, and having heard them reason together, Jesus reasoning with those disputing with him or debating with him, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, said, for he asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? So Mark report that he asked the first commandment in all. In all. Listen to the concept of Matthew. Matthew reports the same occurrence but differently. In Matthew 22, verse 36, he says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So Matthew says, the man did not just ask first in listing them. Because first in listing them, thou shalt have no other God before me. So that is first in listing. But Matthew records the desire of this man was the greatest. So he's not looking at the listing the commandment. But his concern is, if you put all these ten commandments, or you place the law of God, the decalogue, four on the first table of stone, six on the last table of stone. If you place them together, O oh Lord, which is the greatest, so that if I break the greatest commandment, then I have done the greatest sin, and as a result, I'm the greatest sinner. That's the question. This is the response of Christ. Go to verse, 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 verse uh, 29. Jesus answered and said, Hear, O Israel, 
the greatest, the first commandment of all is, Hear, O Israel, the, 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 the Lord thy God, the Lord our God is one Lord, mm -hmm. and thou shalt love the Lord thy God, verse 30, with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Yeah, Jesus concluded by saying, This is the first of all commandments which Matthew, or that is Mark, which Matthew will call, which is the greatest, according to the language of Matthew. So according to Mark, the first of all commandments, first in preeminence, not first in number, is summarized by saying, love for God. Which Matthew called, that will be the greatest commandment. Verse 31, in the second is like, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now one concept, one thing is, constant in this the greatest or the first of all the commandment of first in the law of God is love for God the second is love for man now that is the greatest commandment what does that mean look at the concept the four things which Mark lists let's go through them once again verse 30 of Mark 12 and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all. In the book of Christ, page 44, paragraph 2, we are not the Lord's unless we are his entirely. That means complete love for God. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's. We are not his. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. That is what Mark, Mark calls, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. What does that mean? That means spiritually, God should be my all and in all. And with all thine soul. That means emotionally, I've loved God completely. And with all thy mind, that means intellectually or intelligently, I've given my intellig intelligent faculties to God entirely. And all thy strength, my physical strength is committed to him. I'll say that again. Loving God entirely, meaning according to the word or the language of Mark, we are dedicated to God spiritually. He will be supreme in our spiritual life. Emotionally, he will be supreme. Our emotions are given to him. He dictates, he controls, he guides our emotions. And mind, intellectually, his thoughts is registered or impressed in our mind. We will think of him all through. And by the way, according to, uh, according to the language of uh, Malachi chapter 2, 6, 3, 16, it says those are the people God is going to seal. He's going to write them. They're the pre precious jewels because they thought upon his name. Their mind is always constant or steadfast on God. And then with all their might, physically, they spend their physical strength in God, like the Apostle Paul says, willing to spend and to be spent. So they have consecrated themselves to God. Now, that is the greatest commandment according to God. And the second is like, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, let's come to our question or our subject. What is the greatest sin? We have so identified the greatest commandment is love to God. Entire surrender to God, giving God completely, giving yourself complete to God, physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually to God. Paul summarized this in Romans chapter 13, verse 10. The last line says, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Because he's speaking the context of the six, the last six commandments. Because he, if you love your neighbor, you not do ill to your neighbor. And he says, love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, now we found the greatest commandment. Entire or supreme love for God. Then, don't you see? Breaking that commandment must be the greatest sin. And if... I have not loved God with all my mind, 
soul, heart, strength, then I violated the first and the greatest commandment of God. That is my greatest sin. Now let me ask you, viewer, do you love God? Do you love him entirely? With all your heart? With all your soul? With all your mind? With all your strength? Or are you guilty? Are we guilty of breaking that commandment? Have we entirely consecrated ourselves to God? Entirely. In Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 18. Righteousness, paragraph 1. Righteousness is love. That means obedience, righteousness, the life of Christ. Righteousness is divine. That book is righteousness is love. And love is the light and the life of God. Have we thus loved God? Completely. That means we have righteousness. We can never talk of righteousness by faith until our love for God is entirely. We can never talk of being Christians until we give ourselves to God completely and love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. If there's a part of us not surrendered to God, maybe emotional being of us, then we are transgressing that first and greatest commandment. It is easy to talk about things, programs, ideas, activities. It is easy to define systems. It is easy to talk about dates and events. It is easy to be good Bible teachers. It is easy to be good prophecy students. It is easy to talk of all the reformations, but unless our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength is dedicated to God. We are not Christians. Could that be our greatest error? Good ministers, good preachers, good reformers, good administrators, good thinkers. By the way, we need more than intellectual greatness in the church of God. We need a love for God. Entire consecration. Why do, you talk, why do you talk much of his love? Has the Savior not said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandment. The Greek verse simply says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. That means naturally, that love of God in the soul leads a sinner to God. It leads us into obedience. It leads us into righteousness because the righteousness we found is love. We can never sin against God, be guilty of any sin. If we will love God, how much? Entirely. That means with all your spirit, with all your emotions, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In Mount of Blessing still, I love that book, that's why I'm quoting it much. Mount of Blessing, page 76, paragraph 3. The writer Ellen White says these beautiful words. God does not employ compulsory measure. Love is the agent he uses to expel sin from the heart. Listen to it once again. God does not employ compulsory measure. That means God does not force. Love is the agent he uses to expel sin from the heart. By hate, that means by love, he changes pride. Are you guilty of pride? Am I guilty of pride? All we need is love. By love, God changes pride and unbelief into humility and love. All we need now is to ask God one thing. If love is righteousness, is love, then for us to be righteous, we need to ask Him that love. The same book I was reading you, page 77, paragraph 1, Mount of Blessing, talking about God. God is love. His very life is, a, is an outflow of unselfish love. His very life, that is why it is righteousness, his very life is the outflow of unselfish love. Then we can ask God tonight or this day, 
Father, may that love flow, the unselfish love, let it flow right to our hearts. Fill our hearts with the love. Break us with your love. And if you can ask in that, the promise is, ask and you shall receive. We can ask him tonight or today, this very moment, Lord, give us your love. And how do you receive that love? Final text is in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad. To shed abroad means it is imparted. Because the love of God is imparted or shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Remember, God is love. That means love is the nature of God. Do you want to obey God? Do you desire righteousness? Do you desire to be saved from sin? Do you, do you desire a life of holiness? Because righteousness is holiness. Then all we need today, God, we open our hearts. Pour your love in our hearts. Pour righteousness, which is love. Give us Christ, for we receive righteousness by receiving Christ. So friend, in summary, this is what we've studied tonight. Which is the greatest sin? And remember, our attention was so much on sin, we were looking for the solution to our problem, which is sin. And this is what we found this day. The greatest sin is transgressing the greatest commandment. And which is the greatest commandment? We found the greatest commandment is love for God. And we found we might be guilty of breaking that commandment. That means we've not entirely given ourselves to God. And we can ask God this moment, pour your love in our hearts. Give us your nature, which loves obedience. And so may God bless us and give us peace as we ask him that once again, pour your heart in our love, in our hearts, to enable us be like God, to enable us reflect God, to enable us demonstrate that God has said that. And may God bless you for making the commitment tonight, this day. I'm sure you desire to make it. God bless us for giving ourselves to him. And God bless us for accepting him because righteousness is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we are nothing. As you know, said, without me, you can do nothing. But we can do all things by his power or him in us. So let's ask God this day again for his blessing. Heads bow wherever you are. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We are guilty of the greatest sin, transgressing the love of God. That means we are guilty. We are not really given ourselves to you completely. We are sorry for this. Blot this transgression from our hearts. And may you fill our hearts with your very nature, which is love. May the, un may the unselfish love, which is the very outflow of the life of God, fill our hearts today. Give us Christ to live in our hearts. May the Spirit of God bless that nature of God in our hearts. This is our prayer of faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you.